brought up and close uh, the two books that I was most influenced by were J.P. Dunleavy's The Ginger Man and Brendan Peel's Porcelain Book. I think Behan was a great loss to Irish literature in many ways. He died at 42. How would you rate his, his work, particularly the Porcelain Boy, I'd say, on Giel, on the hostage? How do you view them? Uh, I, I think that he died, uh, he died uh, greatly interfered with his life. Greatly, I think, with the Porcelain Boy, the masterpiece. Uh, uh, the um, Giel was the, the Irish version. He wrote the hostage in Irish. He learned to speak Irish in jail. Uh, he learned it from a, um, a, a, it was a Kerry man who was in jail with him, and uh, he was really bilingual, and he wrote most of his stuff in Irish, so that's where the young deal comes from. I just heard him the way, the fellow I was talking about, his friend, he told me they were coming across the border once, he and Brendan, and Brendan was wanted, I think, for being in the IRA, but he still, when the police stopped, he couldn't resist giving out to the police. And he got out and he started crawling along under the car on his hands and knees. And the police said, this guy that was with him said, well, don't these guys get us? And the police said, what are you doing down there? I'm looking for the border, said Brendan. <laughs> Another time, he, um, when he landed in New York, the, 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 um, uh, the Newspaper men were all over the place. His reputation, that was the thing that Brendan was a victim of his own image. He created this image, and rather than give that up, he let his art suffer. But was it particularly difficult for him the time that he came to prominence with the advent of TV? Absolutely. A TV sucked the I Brendan out of him. It sucked the Brendan out of him till there was nothing else left there but the shell. He, they, they, when he landed, they said uh, they had, they had, he had, he had, he had the reporters and a police escort, and one of the men said, the uh, reporter said, do you always have a police escort in Dublin, Mr. Ben? Yes, I do, but I'm usually handcuffed to <laughs> And you see, that gets all around. This was everywhere. The last word he said, the, the, the sister, when Monica cleaned his lips before he, when he was dying, he said, he, out, of, out of the depths, he said, God bless you, sister, may you be the mother of the bishop. <laughs> Well, you're a particular authority on pre-independence Dublin, but there seem to be an extraordinary bunch of people, particularly in the writing world, like Oliver Stitch and Bogarty, Joyce, Yates. How do you think that happened, and how would you compare, say, the literary world now with the time of what's, what is generally called the Irish literary renaissance? Well, of course, uh, renaissance, only uh, only been a few of them in the world anyway. I mean, there's the Italian renaissance, there's English 16th century renaissance, French 17th, and then the Irish ones. It's a, it's a unique period, and I think it was, because not only did it produce great uh, writers, but great painters. But if you look at it, there's three Nobel Prizes for, for, for literature from Dublin alone. No city in the world has done that. You had Padre Callum, you had Gogri, you had Joyce. You had the, the best prose writer in the world, Joyce, and the best poet in the world was, was Yeats. And the, the people like Gogri, the actual book of English verse, the uh, authentic uh, volume of all English verse, has got 18 poems in it by Oliver St. John Gogarty. Uh, and one, uh, uh, more than any other poet. I just, I'll just do one little tiny short one for you there. Yes, yes. Yeah, give you an idea of the magic of that man who was a surgeon. Uh, that was his uh, profession. But uh, had 18 poems as a surgeon in Dublin in the, in the leading uh, literary book of the world. Chosen by an Englishman, said, not, not by one of our own. But anyway, this is, this is a poem about uh, his little daughter used to go up the hills with him every day at lunch from Dublin. He'd be operating in the morning, seeing his patients in the afternoon, and he'd go up the hills, and he'd lie down there and have his lunch with the daughter. And she was running around one day, and she, her, her stockings got stained yellow. And she came up to him, and was crying to him, and he said, he wrote this poem for her. Golden stockings you had on in the meadows where you ran, and your little knees together, Bobs like pippins in the weather, where those breezes rush and fight for the dimples of delight. I have many a sight in mind. I have many a sight that would last if I were blind. Now I only see but one, see you running in the sun, and the and the 
Now I only see but one sea running in the sun and the gold and the gold dust coming up from the trampled buttercup. We translated by Joyce the kind of man he was, and because you've written the book about him, there's just another quote from the Barber book. But Joyce was not simply a serious minded experimenter who took the modernist novel to its ultimate conclusion. He was a great and playful satirist with a highly developed comic imagination. Now, I wanted to ask you about that yeah. kind of comic imagination because when you say that the novel is effectively on its last legs and not worth doing, how would you view someone like Flynn O'Brien, particularly the, uh, the, the third policeman? Well, I, that's a very good question. I think, you see, what Joyce and Van O'Brien's both decided was that the English language had exhausted itself for expressing something new. Just, Joyce wrote Finnegan's Way, uh, which is a new sort of language, and then uh, the third police, the third police, it was the same thing. It's, it, it's a totally different angle for language, and you don't get it all at once. Or you do get it all at once, but you don't, it, you don't actually understand it all at once till it goes on and on. But it says something that cannot be said any other way. And that the, the ordinary novel of today won't say it. It won't penetrate deeply enough into the subconscious as we know it through all the things, science and otherwise, to tell us what life is about. Which is, yeah, that's the artist's function. I tell you, there's a, there's a the opening of, Finnegan, of Finnegan's Wake describes the river Liffey. Uh, just three sentences or something, I won't hold you up. But this is the sort of thing that takes in, uh, um, Adelivia is what the Liffey is called, uh, uh, as, as a woman. And he just sees it bubbling in the hills. First of all, worst of all, the weekly lively, she side slips out by a gap in the devil's glen while Sally, her nurse, they sound asleep in a sloop that fee fee fi fee fell over a spillway till she laughed and wriggled in all the stagnant black pools of rainy under a fellow crew. Can't you hear the ripple of the <laughs> You won't find that in Trinity College. 